Good afternoon. Welcome distinguished guests, faculty, and friends to this very special event, the fifth annual Ernie Koo Distinguished Lecture. I should say Ernest S. Koo Distinguished Lecture. Each year, the Koo Lecture brings an outstanding leader in technology and engineering to our campus. And we are always delighted to have uh, these leaders tell us about their views on what's happening in science and technology. Uh, the Intel co-founder, Andy Grove, presented the first lecture, and uh, we've had, uh, followed by three other uh, captains of industry. This is the first year that we have an academic addressing us, and we are very proud to say we are continuing the tradition of excellence with our 2016 coup lecturer, Gary May. Welcome, Gary. The series was endowed through the generosity of Ernie and Bettine Koo, who have been truly exceptional citizens of our College of Engineering community. A professor of ECS and a trailblazer in the design of integrated circuits and systems, Ernie was a former dean of our college and a national leader in engineering education. We were deeply saddened to lose Ernie last fall, and this is the first Koo lecture we are celebrating without, uh, without him. I'm very pleased that uh, members of the Koo family are here. Bettine uh, had a uh, small accident this morning and is not able to join us, but uh, I've been told nothing to fear. But we are very proud to have uh, Tony and Ted here, and you'll hear from Tony in a few minutes. This year, the Koo lecture is also the keynote of EECS Berkeley Engineering Stars and Technology Program, or BEST. Today's day-long program celebrated the accomplishments of African-American engineers, and it brought outstanding alumni to campus to meet with our students to discuss the challenges and opportunities in technology today. Both the BEST program and today's Koo today's lecture have been co-sponsored by two of our student societies, the UC Berkeley chapter of the Black Engineering and Sci uh, Science Student Association, BESA, and our Black Graduate Engineering and Science Students Association, BEGIS. Uh, thanks to both of these uh, great student groups for their work. And they're in the back with the Berkeley Engineering Church, so thank you. <laughs> there can be no doubt that American innovation depends on a smart and diverse technical workforce. To ensure that diversity, engineering, school needs to keep getting, engineering schools need to keep better at attracting and graduating more students from underrepresented groups. Few people have done more to meet that challenge than our Koo lecturer, Berkeley alumnus, Gary May. And I'm not alone in that opinion. Last year, to recognize Dr. May's contribution, President Barack Obama honored him, along with our own Dr. Sheila Humphreys, with the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Men Mentoring. So congratulations. <laughs> And you too, Sheila. <laughs> Gary is Dean of the College of Engineering at Georgia Tech, one of the top engineering schools in the country and the nation's largest producer of engineering graduates. He received his bachelor's degree at Georgia Tech before coming to Berkeley to earn his master's and PhD in EECS. He joined the faculty at Georgia Tech, focusing on computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits. He served as chair of ECE before becoming dean in 2011. He's the author of more than 200 publications, is a fellow of the IEEE and AAAS, and he has been much honored for his research and mentorship. Under Gary's leadership, Georgia Tech has a remarkable record of success in bringing underrepresented students into STEM fields. Winning some $20 million in grants for his work, he created a summer program for undergraduate students to conduct research at Georgia Tech encouraging them to enroll in graduate school. As we heard when we talked to him, more than 73% of these participants have enrolled in graduate school over a uh, sustained period of time. In addition, he created ambitious programs designed to increase the number of underrepresented PhDs produced by Georgia Tech. To date, 433 minority students have earned their doctorates in science or engineering there, more than any other university in this nation. And he also told us 32 of them have become professors. So that's a replication also there. 
Can this success be replicated elsewhere? Gary will share his thoughts on that today. We are honored to have him back at his alma mater. So uh, I, was, I was gonna say, please welcome Gary May, but before I do that, I'd like to invite uh, Tony Koo to say a few words. And after that, we're delighted to have you, to welcome you, Gary, please. Tony. <laughs> Well, thank you, Shankar. We're very pleased to have Gary here today uh, to give the fifth Ernest S. Koo Distinguished Lecture. Uh, thank you, Gary, for giving this lecture. Uh, I first met Gary, actually, when we were uh, department chairs. And there's a department chairs and heads meeting. And it's called the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department Heads Association. And so we both served on the board for a few years. So I got to know and work a little bit with Gary. And he was actually supposed to be president of this uh, association. But then he got word, OK, he got promoted to dean. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very much looking forward to uh, Gary's talk today on broadening STEM education. Also, it's thanks to Shanker's dedicated staff and to the many student volunteers here. As uh, Shankar mentioned, this is the first lecture since my dad passed away last summer. Uh, he would have been pleased at the large audience here, especially the large group of students here. Um, my mom and dad start this lecture series to give back to the Berkeley community. My dad was here for almost 60 years, and he wanted to give back to the Berkeley community. And they wanted to get leaders in both academia and industry uh, to talk about their successes and hear about their experiences and uh, also their insights. So many of these, actually practically all of the lectures, maybe except for one, uh, that have come here are Berkeley graduates. So many of the students here probably don't know much about my dad. I'd just like to say a few words. My dad was at Berkeley, like I said, for almost 60 years. He was a very distinguished uh, educator. He educated many students in, in circuit theory and then later CAD uh, design. Uh, he was also a very distinguished researcher. And then later, well, he served as both department chair and as dean of the College of Engineering. He really loved his job here. And uh, you know, through his many years here, he mentored many students, colleagues, and other faculty, too. I also want to say that he was also a big sports fan. Uh, he enjoyed supporting especially UC Cal Berkeley sports teams and especially the football team. He was also a lifelong tennis fan and actually played tennis. He played tennis with the students and the faculty and, and us too. And uh, he was a big fan of tennis. So I'd like to close on the following, uh, a quote from a famous tennis player, Arthur Ashe, that we both admire. So, true heroism is remarkably sober, very undramatic. It's not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. Thank you. Thank you. So great to be here with you uh, today. I want to first. Uh, express my uh, uh, gratitude to Shankar for the very kind introduction. Uh, the, the students this morning uh, in the BEST program, one of the, student, one of the uh, other panelists talked about this thing called imposter syndrome. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but no matter how much you accomplish in your life, uh, some of us, you just can't get over the feeling that you're, it's not really you, you're an imposter. This is particularly a problem with underrepresented uh, folks like myself. So I, you know, I, they got, I got the invitation to give a distinguished lecture and I started having these anxieties. And then, then I found out Andy Grove was the first speaker. And I said, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, who me? You really can't believe that uh, you're, you're uh, receiving uh, uh, such, such uh, warm uh, regards and adoration from people that, you know, these are, I spent my formative years here and learned a lot from people here. I have lots of friends here in the audience. And I thank you all for coming. I also want to express my appreciation and gratitude to the Koo family uh, uh, for sponsoring this uh, lecture series. Um, I, I did get a chance to know Professor Ku. I'll say a little bit about that later, but um, Tony and I did serve together on this uh, board, but as he mentioned, when I became a dean, they kicked me off, so 
Um, they have standards, so I... <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, let me, let me get, get going here. Um, I'm going to talk about broadening participation in STEM, and um, there's been many ways to refer to this uh, activity over the years, enhancing diversity, broadening participation, affirmative action, all these kinds of things. I just want to say kind of uh, in the beginning as an, as an overview statement that um, this has been one of the single most intractable uh, problems in our profession for many years. Easily, easily at a par or above uh, on the level of, of the grand challenges that the National Academy has published. So um, I think this is, is so important and I'm really pleased to be able to uh, give you my thoughts on the matter uh, and what we might do about it. Um, but first a word from our sponsor. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, I do come from Georgia Tech. I, you know, people have been remarking about my, my golden bear lapel pin today and I can only wear this like once every n years <laughs> because as a dean you have to you have to represent your, your institution. Uh, I, I work at Georgia Tech, and I've been there for 25 years. Um, uh, Georgia Tech's uh, number seven public institution in the country. Uh, you guys probably know who's number one. Um, and uh, we have uh, 25,000 students, 1,100 faculty members, uh, six colleges of which engineering is bigger than all the other five combined. Engineering is about 65% of Georgia Tech. Um, and it's in midtown Atlanta, uh, about a third female. I just want to mention just briefly, uh, the Business Insider magazine said this, not me. Number one smartest students at any public university in the United States. Okay, who, get, who can guess who's number two? <laughs> <laughs> I had to, you know, get back at that first. <laughs> so, uh, in engineering, we're the largest college of engineering in the U.S. We have 13,000 or so students, about two-thirds undergraduates, one-third graduate students. Uh, ranked uh, very highly, um, top, top five or so in U.S. News. Um, we give about 30 to 400 degrees a year and I uh, have about 430 faculty members in the college, which means I have 430 bosses uh, that I report to. Um, uh, we also uh, are the number one producer of engineering degrees to women and underrepresented students, which is one of the reasons I think that, that I'm here today. Um, just to sort of uh, uh, back that up a little bit, uh, you know, just a few, a few tit, uh, tidbits. Hispanic uh, Business Magazine, uh, for actually six years running now, I said we are the best engineering graduate program in the country for that demographic. Um, Diverse Issues in Higher Education annually publishes some rankings about Georgia Tech, and these are just a few of, of the highlights. Um, number one in PhDs to all, all minorities, uh, number one in PhDs to African American students, uh, uh, number one in PhDs to Asian American students, um, and then so forth. And then uh, at the bottom here, uh, number one producer of bachelor's degrees to, in engineering to women. Uh, so um, uh, lots to be proud of there. I, I always tell people this one is uh, interesting, the uh, African-American PhDs. One out of every 10 African-American uh, PhD holders in engineering in the United States got their degree from Georgia Tech. So um, uh, we're, we're quite proud of that statistic. And so uh, how did that happen? Uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, not just me. Uh, <laughs> So this is kind of a snapshot of my uh, career, <laughs> just the, the degrees and the administrative pieces. Uh, I had a very wonderful time here as, in, as a graduate student, went to Georgia Tech uh, immediately after I graduated and been there, t there for 25 years ever since. I, I did want to mention I spent some time working for another uh, Golden Bear alum, uh, Wayne Clough, uh, who's a distinguished graduate who was our president uh, for 14 years and I worked in his office as sort of chief of staff and that was one of the best professional experiences that I had in my career. Then I became school chair and worked uh, for six years leading ECE and then became dean uh, about five years ago. Um, and then a few, few months ago, Southern Company decided to endow my deanship. So, so here we are. Um, uh, I had some fun here at Berkeley, my Berkeley years. Lots to say here. Um, I studied uh, in EECS um, uh, in semiconductor manufacturing. My, my advisor is Costas Spanos. Costas is here. I want to just recognize him, thank him for coming, and you can blame him for all of this. Uh, um, and uh, during this period of time when I was doing this studying, I actually, I never had Professor Ku as a, 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 in a class, but he was one of my prelim examiners. And I remember the experience of being very intimidated walking into his corner office to take my world prelim and, and sort of scribbling some things on the board and not being sure if they were correct. Um, he was very uh, uh, quiet. He didn't give me any much, much feedback, but at the end, he gave me a good score. So I, I'm grateful <laughs> for that as well. So, <laughs> um, 
So uh, while I was here, uh, in addition to what I was doing uh, for my thesis uh, on automated malfunction diagnosis in IC manufacturing equipment, uh, I got a chance to participate uh, as one of the founders of BGIS, and I'm happy to see the BGIS students here helping out today. Uh, so we started the summer undergraduate program. At that time, it was called Summer Undergraduate Program of Engineering Research at Berkeley or Superb. Uh, and uh, that was really a neat uh, experience as well, and actually was something I took with me when I went to Georgia Tech uh, immediately thereafter. Um, and, and I wasn't the, the very first, but I was certainly among the first um, African Americans to get a PhD uh, uh, in EECS here. Um, now, caveat that, you know, um, there were some African students who had done it before us, but uh, I think Valerie Taylor and I were in the same graduating class, and we were sort of among the first here. So that was really nice to be, be in that company. Um, uh, also, before I leave this slide, I want to mention that uh, Larry Nagel is here, and while I was at Berkeley, I was working for Bell Labs in the summers. Uh, Larry was my, uh, my supervisor as well as my mentor in the Bell Labs Fellowship Program, so Larry, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, if I fast forward a bit after my Berkeley years, this was mentioned as well, um, last June, uh, one of my career highlights uh, is not the obvious one here, uh, meeting President Obama, but really just having a chance to do that with Sheila. And if you want to assess blame, again, for me being here, uh, Costas deserves some, Sheila deserves some as well, because Sheila's been a mentor for me and for many of us over the many years that she's been associated with, with engineering at Berkeley. And it was really a treat for us both to be in this, this same picture uh, at the same time. So, um, so that was good. President Obama is taller than you think he is. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a little bit of what motivated my uh, contributions in this area of broadening participation. So I'm going to back up uh, to um, um, my first day on campus at Georgia Tech in, in 1981 um, and then give a couple of anecdotes that, since then that sort of will help you understand why I think this is such an important topic. Uh, so this is kind of the obligatory, serious part of the dis discussion. Uh, when I moved into this dorm, um, you know, if you, uh, at Georgia Tech, this is probably true here too, in the dorms there are name cards uh, for the students moving in. And my first day, and this is, to give you the, the backdrop, this is 1981, and the summer before, or maybe several months before that, there have been these uh, child murders in Atlanta, uh, African-American men primarily being, being abducted and murdered and, or all these things were happening. So there was a little apprehension among myself and more among my parents about me moving to Atlanta. And then the first day, I moved into the dorm on the first day, on my name, my name card's there, Gary May, and my roommate's name was Chip, and I won't give his last name, but on Chip's name card, uh, someone had written in hand, by hand, nigger lover, on Chip's name card, right? So this did not fill me with a sense of uh, comfort. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my mother was apoplectic, she wanted to me to go find another roommate or something. But I, I said, Mom, look, look, it could be I could room with Chip or the person who wrote this, right? So <laughs> Chip would seem to be <laughs> the appropriate choice. <laughs> so I stuck it out. I, I roomed with Chip. Uh, let's see, uh, another story. Um, Ten years later, my first uh, day, uh, first week or so as a faculty member uh, at Georgia Tech, and there weren't very many African-American faculty members. I wasn't the first, but there weren't very many. And I'm getting my mail from the faculty mail room, which also happened to have the copy machine in, in, the, in the room. And uh, minding my own business, getting my mail, someone comes in and starts giving me instructions on what's wrong with the copier and, and how I could fix it. What time will I be able to fix it? I was kind of, what do you mean? <laughs> faculty, this is my name right here on this mail slot, faculty. Uh, anyway, so these things happen. Um, uh, by the way, nothing bad happened at Berkeley, so that's why there's no bullets <laughs> at Berkeley. Uh, one more, one more quick one. Uh, uh, as an ECE department head, uh, we have an annual meeting. Um, uh, always a nice place. We bring our spouses and we have a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, the first one I attended, uh, you know, uh, I was meeting one of the other department heads. Um, it wasn't Tony, but we, uh, the conversation was, you know, where do you, you, know, where do you work and, and what do you, you know, um, what's your area of research and all those sorts of things. And I, as I finish my conversation with this individual, he says to me, um, so what do you do at Georgia Tech? <laughs> Department heads meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these kind of issues continue over time, right? And uh, one more, um, my first week as, was it my first week, first month as dean, 
uh, I got a, a package with a document inside an envelope that uh, was written by an anonymous uh, person who um, titled the, uh, an essay that they wrote, Entitled to Incompetence, an essay regarding the tragedy of the diversity program at Georgia Tech. Right. Um, and the first sentence of that essay, we were driven to write this essay because we are concerned that Georgia Tech is in danger of being dumbed down by the so-called diversity program. Quite an introduction to my job. Uh, I think what's interesting about these kind of things, um, well, you know, my title of the slide is post-racial question mark, not really, right? So um, what's interesting about these things from our alums is, and we still have people that have these concerns, and they email me, and you know, one just emailed me about why do we have a women in engineering program, and one emailed me about, I send out a holiday card, it says holiday card, electronic holiday card from the dean, why is it not a Christmas card, it should be a Christmas card, that's the only holiday we're celebrating. It's the kind of people, you know, I live in Georgia, so these are the kind of people I... <laughs> people I do on a regular basis. Uh, but the interesting thing about this one is, you know, it, I showed you the stats and the rankings on a previous slide. Our freshman uh, class last year was 20% um, underrepresented students, 20%. Seven of those were African American, 8% uh, Latino, and 5% multiracial. The most diverse freshman class we've ever had. Simultaneously, the smartest freshman class we've ever had, if you measure SAT scores and things like that. So these things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, broadening participation, enhancing diversity, is not, there's no, uh, uh, you don't give up quality by, by t undertaking these, these things. Just last night, uh, when I got here, I had dinner with um, uh, Alice Agagino, um, and she said she couldn't make the talk, maybe she'll come in at the end, but anyway, Alice, oh, there she is, hi Alice, <laughs> she came in. <laughs> so Alice was telling me about, so now there's apparently, when you're hiring faculty, or recruiting faculty, there's a, uh, an optional statement they can write about diversity. I hope I'm getting that so, so, sort of right. And one of the candidates wrote something about uh, nothing trumps quality. Diversity is not as important as quality. I just don't know why people jump to this conclusion that these things are different. Uh, you know, you can, there's certainly no reason why you have to assume that quality is going to suffer when you have a diverse uh, 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 group of uh, people working on something. And I'll get more, say more about that. So this is kind of what made me interested in having this sort of parallel career where I was doing my research and teaching my classes and doing these things in, in, in semiconductor manufacturing, which I think were very important and good problems to work on. But at the same time, in the back of my mind, maybe not so in the back, maybe in the front of my mind, were these nagging issues about uh, diversity and, and equality and equity. This is where we are right now in the U.S., right? We have uh, BS, MS, and PhDs nationwide, according to the ASCE uh, data. Uh, these are pie charts showing uh, various demographics, uh, just illustrating the point, and I won't read you to the numbers, but just illustrating the point that we are uh, dramatically underrepresented uh, in, uh, in engineering. This is just engineering, not all of STEM, uh, in, in our production of, of degreed um, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and Native Americans, uh, and, also, and also women. So, um, so, you know, this is a problem. It persists. And, um, it's been a problem for a long time. If you look at the data over the past uh, 40 years, um, this is uh, census data, but uh, it illustrates the same point. Now, this is all of STEM, not just engineering, but um, the very, very modest progress in the numbers, these are percentages of um, African Americans and uh, uh, Latino uh, STEM uh, uh, workers since 1970. Progress, but very, very modest progress. Um, and this compares, uh, STEM is the solid line here, and total employment uh, is the dashed line. But uh, um, so um, today, if we look at where we are in STEM overall, uh, you know, a couple of nuggets here. Um, one, in 10 STEM, one in 10 STEM professionals is a minority woman. Uh, African Americans, American Indians, and Hispanics uh, between the ages of 18 and 24 or 34% of the population, um, but only 12% of undergraduate degrees in engineering and so on and so forth. So this problem, again, has persisted for a long time, many, many years. But this is where we stand uh, as of today. Um, um, there's been a lot of attention recently about Silicon Valley and the tech industry. I do have to say that people you know, coming from uh, another part of the country, I, I have to tell people all the time that all of IT is not Silicon Valley and all of engineering is not IT, but anyway, that aside, uh, uh, this is, some, I can't remember which publication I got this from, but anyway, this is some data on uh, some of the uh, quote unquote tech industry, tech companies in Silicon Valley. Um, I gave this, uh, this was part of the talk I gave at Intel several months ago, kind of illustrating uh, what's going on. Um, 
uh, you can see, again, the, the dramatic underrepresentation of various population groups compared to uh, um, their, their, their demographic uh, 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 status. Uh, uh, what makes this graph even more um, startling is that this is all employees. This is not members of the technical staff. This includes the, the clerical staff and on and on and on, right? So this is a problem, right? And we're not, uh, we're having uh, trouble uh, representing, uh, getting equity and representation across demographic groups in the U.S., um, which also leads to problems in higher ed as well. Um, we are not producing large numbers of PhDs uh, in science and engineering. And this is NSF data here from 2012, uh, hovering around three or four percent uh, at the most in terms of uh, the various underrepresented groups. And therefore, that r causes us to have problems recruiting faculty um, because you've got to have a PhD to be a faculty member, right? So, so um, this problem is a problem not just in the, uh, the technical workforce, it's a problem in higher ed as well. Um, and um, uh, former NAE President Bill Wolf, who I'm sure many of us know, said it very well, uh, why this is an issue, diversity matters, because every time an engineering problem is approached uh, with a uh, pale male design team, it may be difficult to find the best solution to understand the design options or, or know how to evaluate the constraints. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples of why that is in fact, in fact true. Um, uh, you know, uh, the first uh, crash test dummies that were used to test airbags were patterned, uh, modeled on the male anatomy. So when, uh, when, when uh, the airbag would deploy and a woman was driving or in the passenger seat, uh, there were problems. The airbag could, would hit her in the head and maybe cause an injury. Um, uh, voice recognition systems, uh, the very first ones, only recognized male voices. Um, the, uh, give a more contemporary example. Um, if you go to many hotels and maybe airports as well, um, and in the restroom there's an automated faucet that has a sensor, and if I put my hand under the faucet this way, no water comes out. If I put my hand under the faucet this way, water comes out. Right? So we still have these problems. Right? This is this is just this year. <laughs> um, so the point of this is uh, a diverse design team can come up with a better solution, a better outcome. At least that's my thesis, right? Um, uh, and, we, you know, we should be about pulling things together, uh, integrating different perspectives and backgrounds, getting people to look at the problems from different angles. Um, and uh, diversity, again, is less about how you look, really, than it's about how you think or how you approach problems. And this is particularly relevant for those of us in engineering and STEM fields, right? So um, my my point is uh, that it's not necessarily true that more engineers equals more innovation. I like having more engineers, don't get me wrong. But diverse engineers, I think, is a better way to say uh, what is a better metric for what leads to, to more innovation. Um, uh, and, and diverse perspectives are really critical for addressing the problems we face. Uh, you know, there's some research done uh, in Denmark that correlates uh, diversity of firms and their patent activity. And, and the, the particular paper uh, found that firms with diverse workforces were, were more likely to apply for patents and they worked in a broader ranges of fields, uh, in broader ranges of fields. So, you know, um, that's just another example. Quality is affected positively by diversity or negatively by, by the lack of it. Um, um, so, um, so I know you can't say affirmative action in California, right? That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so think of this not in the legal sense, but think of it as acting affirmatively generic sense, right? So we still need to engage students of all backgrounds, colors, genders, uh, to create a robust and global economy, a competitive economy. Uh, we can't afford the consequences of economic disenfranchisement. Um, uh, so uh, I've showed in other slides how this is still needed. Uh, we have a declining number of engineering bachelor's degrees awarded uh, to, uh, to African-American students in our nation's universities, and this has been uh, declining. We had some uh, positive um, uh, trends up until about 2000, and, after, and then after that it's been flat or, or declining for this particular demographic. But at the same time, this affirmative action is broadly supported. Companies want diversity. They want engineers from all backgrounds. They want, uh, they give, as I mentioned, these uh, folks give better outcomes, better solutions, better innovation, more profits. Uh, uh, and so, uh, for example, Merck has been giving 
money to the United Negro College Fund. Uh, very, son, various and sundry tech giants have been uh, talking about this and doing things about this, Intel, Boeing, General Electric, Xerox, on and on, have talked about diversifying STEM, and I'll give a more particular example um, later. So how do we do it? Um, uh, it starts with uh, the continuum. So there's an issue from you know, early childhood education, let's say K through PhD, right? Uh, so we need to address this issue at all levels, and there needs to be seamless transitions between the various levels in our approaches to intervention. Um, great need for teachers in STEM. Teachers, uh, um, quick anecdote, uh, in the state of Georgia, I think this is still true, in the state of Georgia, the most, com well, let me see if you can guess, the most common background of a physics teacher in the state of Georgia, anybody want to guess? Physical education. My cousin is here. <laughs> she, is, she, is that. she is my cousin. <laughs> uh, physical education. So PE teachers are teaching physics in the state of Georgia because physics, phys ed, close enough. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is a problem. Um, uh, and then also there's a big role for community colleges uh, uh, because many of our of students from these populations start at community colleges before they finish their four-year degrees and go into graduate school. So there's a big opportunity there to support community colleges uh, in, in addressing this problem. This is just some data on percentage of high school seniors who meet readiness benchmarks uh, in science, math, and reading. And none of those are numbers you want to brag about. Reading is the best, but science and math are, are both less than 50% of the students meet the benchmarks to be uh, competitive or to be ready for, for college uh, level uh, work. Carl, these are national statistics. Yeah, the, the only st the state was the anecdote, but the rest of these are national statistics. So, um, so the current state of what I'll call a continuum. Some people call it a pipeline. I like continuum because it makes me sound cooler. Um, <laughs> the past two decades, uh, high school completion rates have been stagnant, uh, about 82 uh, percent. Uh, there are gender gaps. Uh, 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 young women have made strides greater strides in many cases than men, but there are gaps that persist uh, um, in, in, uh, in gender, both in uh, uh, enrollments, uh, persistence, and degree production. There are still gaps. Uh, Hispanic folks have made the largest improvement during the same time period, that past 20 years or so, but I still have the lowest high school completion rate, so there's positive and negatives here. Uh, African Americans have shown no appreciable gains in the last 20 years, I mentioned, since 2000. Right? So um, uh, why? Uh, students are not taking the right sort of courses. They don't have the right teachers, as I mentioned. Um, so only 13% per stu 13 of students who get BS degrees in engineering come from these populations, if you accumulate across the populations. Um, and then advanced degrees, the situation gets more dire, right? 7% uh, of master's degrees, 3% of PhDs. And, and I'm asking why uh, role models are important. Right, um, three fourths of working professionals in STEM are, are white, and I, you know, I would add, white, male, able-bodied, Christian, heterosexual. <laughs> there are not diverse populations of engineers, certainly in the workforce, uh, and there is also no role models, or or a few role models, not no, but not enough role models in, in among faculty. As I said before, less than five percent. Um, so uh, issues are affordability, access. Um, uh, you know, uh, everyone needs access to post-secondary education. We'd like to have access in STEM, post-secondary education across the country. Uh, um, affordability is becoming an increasingly uh, uh, significant part of the problem. Um, uh, as uh, for those of us in state institutions, uh, we know this, right, as uh, uh, the, the state governments are becoming less uh, inclined to support higher ed. I guess you just had a incident this week that in illustrated that, or maybe last week, right? Um, it, it's uh, making the, um, what's, what's happening is as states are, be, are being less inclined to support higher ed, we are raising tuition to compensate. Our costs really haven't gone up a lot, right? But we are trying to keep the same level of quality, so, um, so we've compensated by, by increasing tuition. Uh, what's the line, um, uh, I think this is, um, what's the former Michigan president, um, uh, Duderstadt, uh, the line is, we used to be state funded, and then we were state supported, and now we're just kind of state located, right? So, <laughs> um, but you know, if Idaho makes me a better deal, I'm moving to Idaho. Uh, so, 
uh, one of the things that has come up uh, is free college tuition, free community college tuition. The administration, current administration, has actually proposed this. I'm not sure it'll go anywhere. Um, the political discourse right now among the candidates, at least one of the candidates, they're talking about, he's talking about free tuition overall. Probably a harder mountain to climb to get there, but the free community college tuition is actually re relatively reasonable and, and not, not as expensive as you might think. So uh, I'd written an, an op-ed about why we th I think we should do this, because that addresses both of these issues of access and affordability, particularly for uh, underrepresented populations. Um, I want to say a little bit about what we're doing at Georgia Tech and, and then um, save time for questions. Uh, like I said, it's the K through PhD continuum, and we have sort of uh, interventions, enrichment programs, et cetera, at all levels of this continuum. I'm not going to talk about every single one of them, but I do want to mention a couple of highlights there. Um, uh, for example, our Summer Engineering Institute, which we've done for the past uh, seven years or so. Um, we have a three-week residential program, about 50 kids come in, and we give them all sorts of exposure to engineering. We do science and engineering demos, and we go to field trips. Um, other events, mentors, uh, graduate students, and undergraduate students are uh, serving as mentors, and so the idea is to get them excited, aware, interested, and enrolling at Georgia Tech. So we've been doing that for a while, and it seems to be working. Uh, we've got some good uh, partners and sponsors. Um, we have some scholarship programs. Uh, this is one, uh, RISE. Uh, uh, everybody has scholarships. Uh, many people have scholarships, not everybody. Uh, two things I want to mention. Uh, there's also, in addition to the money, there's a mentoring component, so there's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the money. So it's not just, you can't just give people fish, you gotta teach them how to fish, right? So, so that's a very important part of, of these RISE scholarships that, again, that we've been giving. And it's not a lot of money, but and I think this is one thing that people don't realize. You don't, it doesn't really take a lot of money to make this happen. Usually it's a little money to get people over the hump or, or get through a particularly uh, bad situation, bad semester in terms of, of resources. Um, so, um, We've been doing this for a while, fairly selectively. Uh, we, we've, we're going to do a little bit more of it because um, as of something I'm going to mention it later. But um, undergraduate research is another big thing. I mentioned that uh, we kind of started Superb when I was here as a graduate student, and I kind of just hijacked that idea, took it with me to Georgia Tech, called it Sure. Branding is important. Uh, so uh, some are undergraduate research and engineering, uh, and the marketing line is if you want to go to graduate school, be sure. Um, this is a group from some years ago. We have about 35 students every summer that come from around the country, including California, and uh, uh, do 10 weeks worth of research. They write a paper, they give a talk, uh, and they get paid reasonably well. Um, that seems to work as well. And, and as Shankar mentioned in my introduction, about 75% of those students over the years have gone to graduate school, which is great. Uh, we also recruit students during Martin Luther King weekend every year. We call the program FOCUS. FOCUS doesn't stand for anything, but we just like to write it in all caps. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's true. Uh, a day and a half uh, uh, event, uh, two and a half days, I'm sorry, about 200 students every year. Uh, we give, and a student, the graduate students at Georgia Tech really run this program. The faculty, we just kind of, we just, you know, sign our names and, and get out of the way. Um, but they have academic uh, enrichment, uh, they learn about the environment, they learn about research, they learn about the culture, uh, they do professional development. The point is not so much to get them to come to Georgia Tech, although we would love that. We tell them we just want you to go to graduate school anywhere. We'd love for them to go to graduate school here at Cal. Uh, we just want these students to, to think about graduate school. So it's been, it's been very successful, and we've been doing it for you know, more than 25 years now. And, and it's, well, from the time we started Focus till now, we've doubled our own uh, underrepresented graduate population uh, in engineering. So, so there's some, some success there. By the way, uh, these people are two of my former PhD students who are off in academe, and both of them, the reason why I wanted to show pictures of them, Francis Williams and Greg Triplett, both of them um, are now uh, associate dean. Well, Fr Greg's an associate dean now. He's at Virginia Commonwealth. Francis is leading a center at, uh, uh, at Tennessee State. Um, so they've both done well for themselves, and I'm, I'm proud of them. So, um, And uh, another program, FACES, stands for Facilitate, Facilitating Academic Careers in Engineering and Science. Uh, uh, marketing, changing the face of the professor. Right? Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, a multi-university effort. We are the lead. We have partners, Emory, uh, Morehouse, and Spelman, all Atlanta, University, Atlanta colleges and universities. Um, we've done this for 15 years before the funding model changed and got significant support from NSF to do that. This was mentioned in the intro. 400, during this 15 years, 433 PhDs in STEM at Georgia Tech were produced, and 32 of those became tenure-track faculty members. 
uh, some of them won awards like PCASE awards and career, NSF career awards and done very well for themselves. So uh, a lot of things we're proud of here. This is one of my favorite pictures of all time. Don't these guys look like, you know, as my, you know, my the kids say, gangster? They look really, this is, <laughs> love this picture. But I showed, my wife said, where are the women? So, <laughs> um, as, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> so the FACES program transitioned in 2013 to um, this University Center of Exemplary Mentoring, which is sponsored by the Sloan Foundation. We're one of several institutions that have uh, been successful in, in getting support from Sloan to do things that are similar, uh, academic enrichment, uh, career preparation for graduate students to get them through successfully uh, their PhD programs and into academic careers or, or research careers otherwise. So uh, this program is supporting about 21 students over three years. We just got renewed for another three years, so it'll be more than that. But uh, uh, it's working, working very well. So both of these pictures are at commencement, you know, uh, particular commencement uh, where, um, you know, several students got PhDs in engineering all at the same time. Uh, that's a pretty impressive uh, picture. Uh, not a lot of universities can take such pictures, right? Um, so the continuum works. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these stories, but uh, the idea that I'm trying to convey here is that uh, for all of these students, so Seneca, Alexis, Nicholas, and Mario, um, you know, they participate in each of these programs along this continuum. They do pre-college programs, they do some of the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring or scholarship or uh, uh, the, the undergraduate research programs and eventually they graduate and they do other things with their lives. Some, like uh, Mario, comes back and he now works, he's working at, um, I forget where he's working, but he's coming back and working with the students that are in the Summer Engineering Institute as a part of his uh, efforts with his company. So there's a feedback loop here, which is also very important. Um, so, um, good stuff. Um, I, I talked about companies. I just want to mention that uh, your neighbor here, Intel, um, announced that they would uh, have parity in their technical workforce by 2020, which is a pretty ambitious goal. Um, they, d they had $300 million that they sort of um, scraped together from other sources, and they said they were going to apply that to this, to this effort. Um, uh, we were among the first, I think the first, university to get a piece of that. We got $5 million, not to do something new, but to do, to reinforce some of the things we were already doing well that we were showing to be successful. So we have a nice partnership with Intel going forward. This is the first year of, of, of five, um, and uh, we're hoping to, to, to do even better to help Intel reach their goal. Um, so the uh, title of the talk was, where we've been, where we're going, this is the where we're going part. Uh, a few short years from now, uh, the workforce uh, uh, in 2020 will be 50% uh, female, 31% minority. Uh, but that's the overall workforce. That's not the STEM workforce, right? Uh, uh, the, the STEM workforce is pretty much at odds with that. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's predominantly white, male, uh, able-bodied, et cetera. Um, and if you don't believe me, and this is a problem, look ask the Census Bureau, because the Census Bureau says that nearly every demographic in the United States is having a relative increase in their population except for Caucasians, right? So that's a, going the other way. So we're not going to be able to continue to, to, to mine the same gold you know, for, for uh, years in, into the future because there's going to be less talent available from those traditional sources. But we've got to do something about this uh, or we're going to have trouble uh, with um, replacing uh, retirees in the current technical workforce, um, uh, addressing the need for talent in sectors where uh, opportunities uh, exist, but and, and demand is high, uh, but talent is, is scarce, and we're going to need this to be able to remain competitive. And yes, I think we're we're really taking a risk by not addressing this problem ag aggressively. Um, so if we don't act, uh, it certainly could erode our uh, innovation capabilities, make us less competitive, um, uh, increase the migration of jobs to other places. Uh, and, and all sorts of so, 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 so bad, bad things. Uh, so we, it's really important and incumbent upon us to take action and continue to take action sustainably over a long period of time until this is fixed. Um, uh, you know, I think we need schools that, creating, that are creating programs like the ones I've talked about. Uh, role models, again, are, are a necessity. Uh, we need to have a coordinated comprehensive plan that goes all the way from K through, through PhD, really. And I, I often say that we've got all the pieces. We sort of know how to do this, uh, as we've shown examples. There's a thousand points of light. There's no constellation. There's no coordination. Right? There's, um, if we just had the, the proper application of resources and the national will, we could solve this problem if we did it sustainably right? uh, over a period of time. 
Um, there's a got, lots of good examples of people that are doing great things. And I, I hesitate to put slides like this up because you always leave people out, but this is just some of the, in addition to what we're doing on our campus, some other programs I think are, are noteworthy. Uh, in particular, Level Playing Field, which is uh, uh, Mitch and Frida, which are our, our friends uh, here in, in the Bay Area are, are doing good things as well uh, in order to address these, these issues. So I don't want to pretend like we're the only people that are doing good things at Georgia Tech. So. Um, uh, these initiatives uh, have to be not just top down, although the president, CEO, leader has to be uh, supportive, has to be a commitment. Uh, I, I really worry about places that have a diversity office uh, only because, not that those aren't well intended people that do good things, but the, the, the tendency is for everyone else to sort of throw things over the transom to the diversity office when diversity is everybody's job. Everybody's job, right? Uh, we've got to have partnerships. Uh, as I mentioned, some of those. We've got to have this link to success and business strategies, and it, has, it should be a part of corporate responsibility uh, uh, and, and long-term commitment. And the, and the bottom line is just is action, action, not, not just words or more studies. Um, so uh, you can consider this a call to action, change the equation. Uh, a quote that I like, let's encourage the next generation to study STEM by teaching them that technology that surrounds their daily lives is not just for their consumption, but it's for them to create and build upon. And um, that's because, as uh, Bill Wolf said, uh, diversity matters. That's my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to invite some questions from the audience. And first preference to students. All right, you got a microphone, microphone. I think there's a yeah, microphone. microphone. Uh, tell us name and anything you'd like. <laughs> Hi, my name is Reagan Patterson. I'm a third year PhD in environmental engineering and I wanna thank you so much for being here for your talk. Um, my question gets back to the slide basically that said it's not about the money. Um, we had a student here who had both the NSF and the GEM fellowship, but she still decided a black woman who was here um, with both NSF and GEM, but she decided to leave. And so again, it's not about the money, it's about the support and the mentorship and investing right. in diverse students. So wondering if you could speak more on um, ways in which faculty can better support, mentor, and invest um, in students of color. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me answer it this way. I think that a lot of times when we develop these initiatives, interventions, and programs, we focus on, on the student participant, right? And we, and, and rightly so, uh, that, that's important. But, so we act like we have to fix the student when we sometimes also have to fix the environment, right? So, um, so there are lots of things we can do, cultural, uh, climate studies, uh, um, various types of activities. Um, uh, 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 there are people that do these things very, very well, but we have to recognize that there are deficiencies in, in these environments that we're putting these students in. And um, I said this earlier in one of the meetings that we just had, uh, uh, you know, there, racism and sexism and all these other isms exist whether we talk about them or not. So we should talk about them and, and try to address them. Actually, uh, Vice Chancellor Naila Nasir was talking, I think it may have been the same person so we, at lunchtime about uh, the case that you mentioned, please. <laughs> the weather is nicer there today. <laughs> Great, two great questions. The first question is about uh, uh, the lack, perceived lack of 
uh, programs on, on the West Coast, if I'm saying it correctly. But I think that's kind of an artifact of just population shifts. You know, most, a lot of the uh, programs, uh, at least uh, in, in the early part of this initiative, the, 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 uh, uh, the movement, if you will, uh, happened because of uh, um, uh, particular needs expressed by African American students, which tend to be in the Southeast and have gradually moved across the country, and there's just higher concentration of, of that population. Uh, as, as, as shifts are changing, the Hispanic population is growing faster than any other demographic, and so you're seeing more and more um, uh, activities like this for, to impact those students, and those are happening here in the Southwest and in other places. So I think that's just kind of an artifact of, of population movement over time. Second question is about what can you do if you're a student. Um, I think um, you have, even if you're, certainly you have advocates on campus, but you also have alumni that can be supportive. You have uh, uh, business leaders that can be supportive. Uh, I don't know, I can't answer the question where you should go if you're on a particular campus without being there, but there, you certainly can uh, um, expand, you know, broaden your horizons in terms of what you think about in terms of people that might be able to at least have a conversation with you, uh, and it can be influential. Believe it or not, do you also have some allies among the, um, among the faculty? It may not be obvious, uh, but um, uh, one of the things that is most gratifying to me in my place is that I'm not always the one that has to bring this stuff up now. I mean, some of my colleagues uh, bring this issue up uh, in various scenarios, and it's nothing that makes me feel better than to hear someone who, you know, uh, starting to, to get it, if you will. So I think you should try to, to, to engage your, your faculty, and, and um, you'll, you'll find some that will be more uh, supportive than others, but you gotta keep trying. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Yukichi, and I'm a freshman here. Um, I was wondering when you said that the amount of engineering degrees from African Americans um, started to decrease in 2000. I was yeah. wondering why you think that is. Oh, I, smarter people than me have looked at that issue. I, I think um, uh, for whatever reason, we, kind of, we maybe took our eye off the ball. You know, affirmative action and things became taboo words, and we had less of that. You know, we, Prop 209. And, Et cetera, et cetera. That didn't happen in 2000. I don't remember what happened, but that's an example of, this, of, the, of the trend. And I think uh, uh, it had a, a deleterious effect nationwide uh, uh, for our foreign represented students. Another question. Kirk. Hey, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Kirk Tramble, one of Gary's many students. Uh, <laughs> what's your take on the investment community in uh, investment in startups that are products of your organization? So that's a great question. I wish I had some data, I don't. Um, there is an increasing, at least, awareness of among the entrepreneur uh, startup community that this is something they should think more about. Um, I saw, I've talked about Code 2040, and, and there's some other organizations like that that are at least thinking about, you know, uh, in, in two ways. One is startups making use of, the, of this talent, but the other is startups with educational software as products or things that can help address the problem. So there's two pieces of this. Um, we've got a lot of activity, I won't spend a lot of time, but we've got a lot of activity in entrepreneurship on our campus and, and from an educational standpoint. Um, and there's certainly much interest among these uh, underrepresented communities about, about being in startups or at least starting, you know, running their own businesses. And so there's an opportunity there. I, don't, I just don't have data. Hi, my name is Bria Crawford. I am um, currently a master's student in um, civil and environmental engineering, graduate of Howard University. I know you know Dr. Lorraine Fleming. I do. In fact, so the picture I showed was yeah, Sheila and she I. Yeah, received the assistance. Lorraine sure. was also there with us, but she was in a different picture. So <laughs> Lorraine is also a Berkeley alum. Yes. Way, um, and so speaking of um, Dr. Fleming, I remember having a conversation with her before I came to Berkeley about the dynamic when she was here in the 60s. And of course, I thought, you know, Dr. Fleming, that has changed over the years yeah. um, in terms of a lot of times there are programs, wor programs working on recruitment. However, there's no specific focus on retention yeah. and how can we keep the minority students or the students from um, lower developed communities here in such, um, 
in such environments where they feel like they do not have the support, um, they feel like they are not wanted, and a lot of the times they don't even have the option as to whether they can stay, especially, uh, um, you know, a lot of the times, a lot of the focus on this campus is with the undergraduate students, right. and right now as graduate students, we're trying to get that support from the university in terms of different programs, um, safe spaces that we can have on campus. Right. So what would you say um, Georgia Tech has been doing in terms of Re, um, retention for their graduate for students, and if you have any advice um, that can go out. Sure. Um, first of all, maybe to take a little issue with the, the notion that things have changed a lot since the 60s. I mean, if you go to a Trump rally, you'll see a counterexample, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, I'm a dean. I got to raise money from some people that might be supporting <laughs> that particular candidate. <laughs> anyway, uh, what can graduate students do? Uh, or what, can, what have we done for graduate students? So I mentioned Focus and Faces and some of these programs. These are ongoing programs. Uh, we, have a, we don't have VGIS, we have the BGSA, which is a very similar organization, um, which we support financially and in other ways. Uh, uh, the, the, they are, there is an annual symposium that they put on, which I financially support from my office. Um, they present their research to each other, question, give questions and answers, kind of get practice for you know, doing more formal presentations. Companies come to this, they sell resume books, all these kind of things. We do, we do things to, to just support the, the, the different activities that graduate students have, research activities and, and uh, things that will make them successful. Have an annual um, holiday party at my house for graduate students. Starting to rethink this because the damage from the last one was pretty significant. So I'm <laughs> sorry, I need a bigger house or less fewer graduate students. So <laughs> have time for one last one question. Okay. I want to thank you for the program you've put on. Um, I can relate to most of it. Uh, I was born in 1922 mm -hmm. in the hills of the Ozarks in a little log cabin. Um, there were 12 siblings. And we had nothing modern. My father delivered me. Um, I'm the only one graduated from high school. I came to California in 1936, and the teacher said to me, well, no wonder you're so dumb. You know, she found out where I came from. Yeah. And uh, I had a feeling along the way that um, I didn't belong, and that uh, I wasn't sure that I was able to cope with all these other people that were a higher level than, than I was. So I've, I've been totally self-supporting since my second year of high school. And I graduated from engineering, mechanical, Berkeley, 1945. Right. That's before a lot of people were born. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if along the line here you encourage young people to feel that they are worthy and that they are capable Absolutely. and that they do belong. Absolutely. And I don't know. I guess that's more of a suggestion than a question. Well, <laughs> and it's a great one. Let me just say, yeah. Let me just say uh, that's a great way to end because um, we, you know, we're not that different. These kind of issues over the years have faced various waves of immigration and other other populations over the years. Uh, yeah, Bill Nye has a good quote about race is just a social construct. Um, and we're pretty much the same. If we could get to that point where we sort of all understand that, um, you know, I think genetically we're like 99.9, .9, maybe five or six nines the same. The melanin content in your skin is a very, very, you know, uh, distant, uh, 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 it's a very improper way to categorize uh, people. Um, and I think uh, these, what I've said today applies to, to everyone and I hope that we can all uh, come together in trying to ad address the problem. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Gary, this has been a fascinating afternoon with you, as we knew it would. On behalf of the college, we'd like to present you with a small remembrance of today's event. Wow. It recognizes our deep appreciation for your commitment to engineering education. You me Many up. thanks <laughs> to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our sponsors, Berkeley Engineering Stars and Technology Program, Bessa and Beejus, and especially to Ernie and Bettine Koo for making this outstanding forum possible. 
Please join us outside in the auditorium for a reception celebrating today's events. Thank you all for being with us today, and go Bears!